We're coming in hot with inspiring guests, witty banter, and colorful commentary for today's veterans and military community. This is the Tango Alpha Lima Podcast. They call me crazy cause I'm facing all my giants They try to scare me into thinking I can't fight it They tell me I should never even think of trying But that's just me, I'm gonna live out in defiance Hello Alphas and welcome back to the Tango Alpha Lima Experience I'm Jeff Daly, the Michigan Dailies in California And there's Ashley Goodermuth on the road site unknown or I... <laughs> washington dc oh you're in washington dc nice nice i get you know i i want to tell a little ashley gutamuth story that's what i like she likes it too uh <laughs> she was recently in los angeles doing comedy because that's what you know she does and i got to spend time i got to spend time with with the ag 2.0 and we had a good time we did dinner oh, yeah. we bought we, meaning she, bought shoes. Uh, I went to, to see her comedy, and it was a good time. And then on Instagram, you want to know what the Ashley Gutermuth effect is? If I do a post and it gets a thousand something or other, I'm like, oh, that's a pretty good post. Um, we're approaching 15,000 on a, a little parking <laughs> lot video we made uh, <laughs> that was just not thought out planned out or anything but because it had ashley gutermuth in it it's just blew up so thank you ashley blowing gutermuth. you up anytime and, happy to help all right so tomorrow you can come to this thing i'm having you fly in yeah okay let's do it perfect perfect, perfect. so you're back on the road are you, are you touring right now yes i was yeah i went from Los Angeles to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, then Arlington, then I go to Rhode Island. Uh, so a couple more days left. And you could say you performed all over the state and it, you wouldn't have had to travel very far in Rhode Island. Right, yeah. I'm yeah. actually performing in Eastern Rhode Island, but half of my body will be in Western Rhode Island. <laughs> At the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that is outstanding. All right. You know what else is, well, I mean, it's not outstanding, but uh, we have a very, we have a very important topic. And I think um, you will be able to inspire people to participate and assist. I love it. I love it. All right, let's crack on. Help identifying remaining unknown USS Arizona service members from the American Legion. There are still 85 unknown Navy and Marine service members from the USS Arizona, whose remains are in an unmarked grave. You may be able to help these heroes finally receive a proper burial. It's part of an initiative led by Cle Kevin Klein, a member of Sons of the American Legion, Squadron 176 in Springfield, Virginia. He is the executive director of the USS Arizona Operation 85 project, and also the great nephew of Robert Edwin Klein, a sailor who was killed December 7th, 1941, aboard USS Arizona. Operation 85 is a mission to identify through DNA the 85 or more USS Arizona crew members, Navy and Marine Corps, whose graves have been buried 10 miles away, marked simply as USS Arizona unknowns. We are asking for American Legion support as we try every effort to reach and locate other family members. Klein said the objective right now is to find other family members of the unrecovered USS Arizona crew so they can provide a DNA sample to match with the unknowns. If you are among the family members or know someone who may be, you can begin by contacting a service casualty office or SCO through the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency website. Contact the respective branch or civilian department that your family member served in. Once you have the established contact, the SCO will send a donor kit with instructions and materials for your DNA sample, along with a return shipping container. Your DNA and information will be protected, secured to a case file, and will not be shared with any outside organizations. What do you think, Jeff? I think that I think this is a very honorable effort. I think that uh, families families deserve closure and these people deserve uh the respect of of a specific to them burial not um some not a generic burial but i am 
I am glad that somebody's taking care of them even in the interim, but I would love to see some families and the families out there. I, I think I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand how, you know, somebody's stationed there, right. And then you never hear from them again. I, I just, I would, I, I want them to have this closure. I want them to, um, that's, that's what I want for them. And I, and I yeah. love it any alphas out there who are related to anybody who uh, has not, you know, is this an MIA situation still? But no, because they do have the bodies, right? And they're, they're going to match them with DNA. So it's not actually an MIA, but it's unknown. So if, if, you, if anybody out there has or knows anybody and you can spread the word that uh, this DNA stuff is happening, I, I just think it's really important to the families. Yeah, I think I think it's wonderful. You know, never forget we we have every formal ceremony we do the POW MIA table, which is not something that civilian families, people that don't attend military ceremonies, ever see. Um, I always try to film things when I go to formal ceremonies. When it comes to that, though, I don't. Even though I would love to be able to share that, but it's just I don't want to be disrespectful. I have to find a find a way to do it respectfully. But I think if people could see. You know, we, the, the lemon on the bread plate that we, you know, we toast at the end with water because they didn't have the benefit of wine. We have each of the service branches, all of their covers there um, and the chair leaned up against. So I think just if people, if you have any connection, reach out, see if um, we can maybe identify some of these people to give them a proper burial. 100% agree. Uh, maybe one day we can uh, arrange a recording of, uh, and Holly's saying we have one. I think she's going to, she's probably going to link it in there so that people can see it and maybe uh, we can, we can share it around as well. Um, today, we're going to talk to somebody who does a lot of sharing in a, in a very profound way. Today, we'll be joined by Army veteran Dan Jarvis, founder and executive board member of 220, a nonprofit that assists veterans, first responders, and their families in healing from trauma using neuro linguistic programming. We'll be right back with Dan to learn more about this program right after the break. The American Legion is raising awareness about PTSD and veteran suicide by offering hope, camaraderie, and support. Be the one to help end veteran suicide. The goal of the American Legion's Be The One campaign is to destigmatize asking for mental health support. Be the one to ask a veteran in your life how they're doing. Be the one who saves one veteran. Go to betheone.org and help the American Legion end veteran suicide. Will you be the one? All right, Alphas, welcome back and welcome to Dan Jarvis to the Tango Alpha Lima Experience. How are you doing today, Dan? Jeff, I'm wonderful. Thanks for the invite. I mean, we are so happy to have you. I'm glad that you could come from wherever you are because when you were in the military, I mean, except for when you were deployed, you had quite the the locations. I mean, you were in Hawaii. Wait, where else? Uh, Fort Knox. Huh? Fort Knox. Fort Knox. Fort Knox yeah. Yep. And then there's one more. Alaska. Yep. And then to Alaska. That's quite the collection when, you know, when they tell you, you can see the world. Yeah, they took me away from Hawaii kicking and screaming. So <laughs> now you did go to Fort Knox before Alaska, though, right? So you got that's a, correct. Yeah, you got a crescendo of yep. yeah. Okay, that's outstanding. All right, and then you see you see my friend over there, Ashley Gudermuth, and she's going to take over. And uh, please be kind to Dan. Please be <laughs> kind to Dan. <laughs> Dad, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you um, will get on to your mission, and I really want to hear about it, but I know that you were a drill sergeant for yes. a bit, two years. Do you still have your drill sergeant voice? Um, I do, but I don't like to bring it out very often. So oh. I, I got I got two years of that at Fort Knox, and uh, yeah, so I do have it, though. You did, you did like in reserves. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Um, okay. So can you tell me what is your mission and why do you do it? Um, well, for me, it's, it's an extremely personal mission and, and I'll kind of start from the beginning. Uh, it was March of 2013. I was stationed up in Fort Wainwright, Alaska, 
And I found myself at a really, really dark spot, right? Um, I'd come back from a deployment to Afghanistan. I was an infantry squad leader. Half my soldiers got medevaced out of country. We had eight Purple Hearts in my squad, to include myself. Um, and one of the soldiers from our platoon was killed uh, with a roadside bomb. So I felt a lot of that survivor guilt, you know, just so much that comes with it. And, and then as my deployment was coming to a close, I got the Red Cross notification that my mom had had a massive heart attack. And with about three weeks left in Afghanistan, I got sent home to Florida uh, to try to meet, see my mom one last time, but I didn't make it back in time. So she had already passed by the time I got uh, to Tampa. Oh my God. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a difficult time because, um, you know, when I, I actually stepped on a pressure plate, which detonated an IED on a dismounted patrol that was maybe five, 10 feet away from me. And I was very, um, I was lacking sleep, right? When that, when that event occurred, you know, I literally had about eight months left on deployment where I was literally like a zombie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after my mom's funeral, I'm, I'm finding myself back in Alaska and maybe 11 months um, back. And it was like the first, the weekend I got back up there, you know, I went to the class six store and I got a case of beer and lo and behold, I slept, right? Basically just passed out. And then that became kind of a routine for me, um, not realizing how much damage I was doing to myself on an emotional level because, you know, substance use, alcohol, it, all it does is it prevents you from processing emotions. So you never get to hit your REM sleep cycles and you're always, you know, struggling to, to process those um, traumatic events. And, you know, that was, you know, came to a kind of came to a head March 2nd of 2013. I was in my basement apartment and I was looking at a rifle in the corner of my room and I was done at that point. I was so emotionally, um, you know, torn up. My sleep patterns were horrible, you know, and just, you know, listening to myself and all that negative self-talk, you know, what if I'd have done this? Would, would Doug still be alive? What if I'd have done this? You know, would my guys have made it out? Okay. What if I had done this? And those are the things, the negative thought patterns that just kind of cycle through your brain. And then when you're not sleeping, you know, the emotional overwhelming, it literally just, you know, it becomes to the point where you don't think you're going to see a way out of it. And as a, as a squad leader, you know, who do you go to for help, right? How do you ask for help being in a position of leadership? You know, one, you don't want your commanders to know that you're struggling because you don't want to be moved into the barracks, take your weapons away. You know, your men lose faith in you as a leader. And so suicide became a better option for me. And that, that night when I was looking at that rifle, I heard the kids in the apartment above me just kind of running across the, the ceiling. And it just kind of took me out of that moment. And I realized this cannot, that's a horrible idea. High power rifle, it's going to go right through the ceiling. I don't want to hurt a kid. And then, so I just passed out that night, like every other night. And then the next morning I got a phone call from Ryan, who was uh, one of my soldiers said, Hey, Sergeant Jarvis, did you hear about Corey? And anybody that, that's hearing this knows that, that there's two things that happen when somebody asks you, have you heard about somebody? Either they got arrested or they're dead. I said, nobody, what happened? He said, Corey shot and killed himself last night. Uh, Corey was a 22 year old soldier. He was in the platoon. I had just come out of, so I knew, I knew him. He was a, he was a soldier, um, who was always trying to help everybody else and nobody, but maybe his closest friends knew that he was even struggling. So I always say, Corey saved my life. Unfortunately, it's when he took his own. So I was like watching the men, how they reacted, interacted after, you know, preparing for the memorial service. There was, like, there was no way that was going to be an option for me. So I just continued to push through self-medicated and isolated. And then I was uh, September 11th of 2014. I got medically retired um, off active duty and started a transition journey that literally went from one uniform to another. So I, I used to work in law enforcement prior to going back on active duty. And I went back into, into law enforcement in Central Florida. And then something weird happened. I kind of felt normal again. And that's because the brain operates in the fight or flight in those professions. So you don't feel like that fish out of water. Uh, I did that for another two years and I realized chasing 20 year old kids through the swamps of Polk County, Florida was probably not the best use of time for a 44 year old. And it's definitely a young person's man or woman's position. Um, so I, I put in my, I had enough time. I, I retired out of that, that profession. And then that's when everything kind of came back. Um, the nightmares and night terrors and night sweats, you know, the, the desire to try to self-medicate um, because I was trying to always calm my nervous system. And, you know, at the time, my, my ex-wife, we, we, we talked, she, she wasn't married to me on active duty. So she didn't know my military experience. And she asked me about my experiences and I, sh I shared with her, and then she was literally like, you need to get help or I do because I don't know how to how to deal with this. And, you know, I'm like, well, 
to me, this is normal life, right? This is what we've experienced, you know, 27 months deployed between Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, seen plenty of combat, plenty of death. Um, but now it's like affecting the home life. Um, so anyways, I, I went down the journey of, of mental health. I started, I went to the VA. I no longer had a badge to worry about and I no longer had a security clearance. So I went to the VA. You know, of course, the very first thing that they do is they want to prescribe you medication and then they want to put a label on you. Neither of which is what I was looking for. I was looking for a solution. And, you know, that wasn't a really good positive experience for me. Um, you know, I had like two appointments. Exposure therapy is kind of what they do. Um, and it was started opening up things that I had been trying to bury for quite a while. And after my second appointment, they called to cancel a, a third appointment and I couldn't get back in for four weeks. And then I did one more appointment and then they canceled the next one after that. And I couldn't get in for eight weeks. And that was really the end of my VA journey when it came to mental health. So I said, there's got to be a better way, right? So we start looking for alternative treatments. Um, and I went through a, a myriad of different types of therapies um, with mental health professionals. And I, I had met a gentleman who hosted a, a leadership retreat for men in Tampa, Florida, and he was a retired uh, army colonel. So met some really interesting people there and some people that were in the space of post-traumatic stress recovery. And I started the nonprofit 220 at that weekend. It was a, literally five years ago, April 15th of 2018. It's just when I said the words 220. I mean, obviously everybody gets the reference of, of 22 veteran suicides, whether it's 20, 22, 18, it doesn't matter. It's, it's an irrelevant number. The fact is one a day is too many. And, you know, when I spoke 220 into existence, it was like, you know, people were looking at me like I was crazy. How are you going to do that? I had no idea, right? Non-commissioned officer in the United States Army. I'm an instrument. I'm a ready, fire, aim kind of person. So I'm like, we'll sort that out later. And about six months later, I was invited to a um, a training up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And that's where I had a major paradigm change. And um, I was kind of calling BS to what they were, they were talking about because they're saying, oh, we can heal PTSD within three to five hours. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever, dude. And so I'm like, I, I talked to the trainer of that process. It's, it's something called the Reconsolidation of Traumatic Memories Protocol. And I know the American Legion National has kind of gotten behind that in, in their efforts to uh, get legislation uh, at the DC level. But I, I, I challenge the guy. I'm like, look, if I'm going to recommend any veteran or first responder do this, I want to experience it. And he convinced me to do it in front of the class of mental health professionals and I'm like, giddy up. All right, I'm about to show the world that this guy's full of it. And then in 45 minutes, I looked at the guy and I'm like, what kind of Jedi stuff is this? Because that process, you talk about your trauma and then when you trigger, they get you out of the state. And then they run a visual uh, kinesthetic disassociation process, which is rooted in something called neuro-linguistic programming. And then they do the talk therapy on the other end. All I know is that I had a very severe trigger at the very beginning, you know, on a zero to 10 scale, it was a 10. And by the time we got done with the second phase of it, I'm down to like a one or a two. And I couldn't feel the emotions anymore when I was talking about it. And then that's when I said, hey, what Jedi stuff is this? And then the sleep hits. That night, I remember going to sleep and I couldn't believe um, the deep rested sleep I would get. So we ended up started to, you know, supporting that organization. It's called the Research and Recognition Project. They're up in Corning, uh, New York. And we were raising funds for therapists to get trained. And, you know, it came to the point where when COVID hit, everything dried up. All of our money was going to basically support this other nonprofit. So now we had to regroup as an organization. You know, how do we still, you know, facilitate this? And what we did is we went down the rabbit hole of that neuro-linguistic programming world. And, and we started developing our own processes because it's all open source material, all right? So this stuff isn't new. This technology has been around since the early 80s. You know, how it's been in a specific world in that NLP world. So now we're like, how do we do this where we can actually train each other? You know, and then, you know, being a former law enforcement officer, you know, there are a lot of, uh, most states have exemptions for nonprofits. They can actually do this kind of work with PTSD or anxiety or depression. And we started collecting data on the people that we were working with. Uh, we, were, we were very lucky to have uh, Dr. Martha Corvea. Um, she was a retired VA clinical psychologist, you know, suggest us, hey, you need to start getting data, get the data, get the data. I'm not a data guy. I just see it. I, I see it working. We're setting the vets free, but I mean, okay, we'll, we'll do some data. And then we started collecting the data. And I'm talking about 
all of the people that were going through these processes were healing. So in other words, maybe they were scoring a 78 out of 80 on the PSSI five, which is a, a metric to test for PTSD. And they're dropping down to one and two, which means that they're becoming asymptomatic because what's happening is when the brain is neurologically connecting emotions to memories, that's the negative feedback loop that we get into. That's the, uh, that's the triggers activating. So you got amygdala fight or flight, you know, there's a neural pathway attached to a picture, a sound, a smell, and then there's an emotion attached to that. It's the emotion that becomes problematic. And when a, when a trigger's active, it's actually malleable. So the neuroscience that's coming out is once it's an active trigger, you can actually disconnect the emotional state. You can change the state. You don't change the memories, the details of the memories. Sometimes you even get more vivid and more clear, but the visceral re emotional reaction to it goes away. And that's the process called memory reconsolidation. Right now, we've got data on over a thousand people, pre and post scores, you know, and as long as a person completes the processes, everybody that goes through it is going to heal, right? You can't stop it. Um, from the neurological piece, uh, what we are doing is you're creating uh, start points and end points of the event, like before the event happened, when you were safe, after the event was over, you were safe and you're creating black and white imagery. And then you're activating the trigger between those two bookends. And then all you're doing is a visual exercise. You're actually watching a disassociated movie of yourself watching the traumatic event from bookend to bookend. So you get them relaxed in both um, contexts in, in the chair, watching the TV and watching the self in the chair. And then you do a rapid rewind at the end of the movie. And what you're doing is you're flipping the script on that amygdala and the brain says, whoa, time out here. That's not what this is for. And it detaches that pathway. And when it detaches that pathway, the other two pathways between the emotions and the memory disconnect from each other as well. And then they retract into a different parts of the brain. So the memory will move into your long-term storage through your cerebellum and the emotions will move into the hippocampus. That's a, diff a different part of the brain where, where those emotions are stored for future use. It doesn't make you not feel emotions. You still have access to all the emotions. It's just now that memory is in proper context. And when you see people who are actively suicidal, go through these processes, and then 45 minutes to an hour later, they feel the, the weight release and that you'll see them smiling and you'll see them happy. And, and you don't know how many times we've been told I was at the end of my rope. And if I hadn't done this, I wouldn't be here. You know, and, and one of the things 220, we're a peer support organization. So when you come to us, you actually get another veteran to work with or a first responder to work with. You're not working with a licensed mental health professional. We do have, we have trained some of them and they're doing remarkable work, but the peer part is what's so appealing to so many people because we've all walked in each other's boots, right? We've all walked, uh, you know, the same soil. We fought in the same areas. So you have an instant rapport with the men and women that serve and rapport is the most important part of the process. It's just, they have to trust you enough to go through it. And when they go through it, they come out that other side, they're literally moving from darkness into light. You know, and I always say from a moral perspective, when you find your way out of darkness, you're morally obligated to jump in the pit and show the others how to get out of it. So that's a really cool part is you're making some major changes. I mean, we've had family trees change, you know, men and women that were ready to die who ended up going on and having children, you know, it changed their whole paradigm, their whole worldview. Um, so whether, you know, if you're a, a mom dealing with the loss of veterans to suicide, you know, we cover gold star families. We cover um, men and women who are active duty. We cover men and women who are veterans. Doesn't matter if they were in combat or not. And then we'll also work with their spouses and their children, their minor children that live in the home. And that to me is the really cool part is when you see how fast this stuff works with children, we could change the whole world, right? And that's really the goal is to to set people free from trauma, anxiety, depression, whatever it is that's bothering them and getting them back on the path that they're actually meant to be on. So it's really exciting. Um, I know it kind of, I get a little bit passionate and kind of going into it, but that's just how I am. That's that's the drill sergeant coming in out of me without the, you know, the the voice. So yeah, it's, it's super cool. Oh, that's hey. awesome. I love hearing the story. I was just going to say, uh, I had like seven questions and he answered them all. You're like the dream guest. It's very, I would say that maybe we don't need to get paid today, but Holly's here. So I'm not going to say that. Um, I love how you've turned your personal experience. As you, as you just said, you know, once you came out of the dark, you're, 
you're handing out a lot of flashlights right now. Yep. Um, can you uh, can you touch on this documentary of that you I don't know if you made it or you're just part of it. So um, 220 actually funded the documentary. It's called Healing the Heroes of 9-11, The Way Forward. And Michael Geyer Productions um, actually produced and directed it. He's, he's, he's out in California. And it was kind of funny because, you know, we worked with a survivor from Ground Zero and it was so phenomenal. And the 20 year anniversary was coming up. And I'm like, you know, I really want to do a po- I really want to do a documentary. So I called Michael up and I said, hey, we, we want to do this film. You know, would you would you be willing to do it for us? He said, oh, you'd love to. When do you need it by? I said, well, we'd like to have it released September 11th of 2021. And he's like, you do realize it's July 9th, right? <laughs> and, and I'm like, hey, is that a problem? I, I had no idea what goes in on the back end. So he graciously accepted the contract. And literally that day, he was making arrangements to fly out to New York City where we filmed it. Um, Westgate Foundation actually hosted us at one of their hotels um, right outside of the city or actually in the city. And then we met with uh, first responders that were at Ground Zero 9-11. Uh, we had a, a Marine and a Navy vet and, you know, the, the Navy vet was also at one point NYPD and he is, was a firefighter at ground zero, um, a paramedic that was buried alive twice. Um, Bonnie, her story is amazing. And then, you know, Kim uh, Osorio, which was the the chaplain, her first day as a chaplain for first responders was on September 11, 2001. So, and then we had another um um, Carlo out in uh, Japan, we actually recorded his session. He was actually a firefighter paramedic uh, at the Pentagon when the, when the Pentagon got hit. The hearing their stories were absolutely just unbelievable. Um, just all of them had struggled for about 20 years, actually right at 20 years with PTS. And then we did the work with them off camera. Then we brought them back on to, hey, how do you feel now? And it's like, you know, claustrophobia wasn't an issue for for Bonnie, who was literally buried alive twice. Um Johnny Walker was a the Marine that was at Ground Zero, had never been back to Ground Zero since then, actually went back um, and was able to participate at the memorial. Um, it was just incredible. And, you know, Carlo ended up returning to the Pentagon for the 20 year anniversary. And these are men and women who had been struggling for such a long period of time. And now they're they're sleeping. They're not being triggered. They're not getting emotional roller coaster. And the whole purpose of that film was to to show the world that you you don't have to live with PTS, right? You know, you don't have to struggle. You can literally let go of all of those emotions that are attached to it. And it really takes, you know, I think on average for us, it's three to four sessions. So maybe three to four hours worth of work. And and the, the remarkable part too is it doesn't have to be military trauma, right? It could be childhood sexual trauma. It could be child abuse. It could be, you know, it could be anything in the trauma spectrum. Maybe it was a bad car crash. And I think probably 80% of the vets and their first responders we work with, we go into those professions because we want to be helpers because maybe we endured something as children and then wanted to be servants to the community. And so to be able to go back and work on childhood trauma and we don't let them talk about it. So it's not like you're not doing talk therapy. You know, we're just having them think about the event, activating the emotion, set the process, disconnecting it. And they're dumbfounded that they just disconnected a childhood trauma. Like for me, my worst stuff was when I was 11, right? It wasn't even combat. To be able to let it go and and to improve the, your quality of life, to improve relationships. You know, maybe maybe somebody had childhood sexual abuse and now they can be intimate with a partner. There's just so many things that that's, that's significant. And, you know, and I, I love what we can do with the children um, because they're very, very quick. Probably 80% of the kids that we work with only need one session. Uh, extremely resilient bounce back very quickly. And yeah, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty powerful uh, testimony. Um, the fact that we stand on shoulders of giants and we're just improving things that have been here for, for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And to, to give it to the world, you know, it's, it's pretty remarkable. All right, Dan, I, I, I want to make sure we get this in here. Um, the, the, I see a documentary link on YouTube. Can, is that a trailer or is that the whole thing? The, the the whole documentary is on YouTube. And, okay. and if you and if you go yeah, to the Holly will put it Holly will put it in the show notes and uh, make sure that all the alphas out there get to see it. Uh, Ashley, do you have a follow up? Yeah, I do. What what a, you know, I'm sure there's people that don't know what their triggers are. Mm-hmm. What about repressed or suppressed memories? 
we deal with it all the time. So what we do is we go back to their earliest memories and we'll walk them forward and they'll typically trigger something. They'll find something. Um, and, and then here's the remarkable part too, is when you activate, say you have a known trigger, but you have a bunch that you don't remember. Cause we deal with that a lot with law enforcement and firefighters. Cause they have careers of trauma is once you start disconnecting the events, the, the brain will then start processing. All right. And a lot of people will start that first day processing. And, and next thing you know, they remember other events and that allows us, that, that's why everything typically in a single session. I mean, if it's a single event trauma, yeah, one session and they're, they're probably good to go. But for those of us that have had years of it, um, if you can identify the earliest traumatic experience and their worst, they're all neurologically connected. So think of like a string of pearls. When you start healing those, the brain will literally disconnect uh, many of the other triggers that are present. And then next thing you know, you can remember. I worked with a one of my soldiers. I worked with his stepmom because she'd lost her son um, to a traffic fatality and she couldn't remember five years of her, like five years of school teachers. So she repressed from the eight, she remembered kindergarten, but she couldn't remember till like the seventh grade. So we went back we activated a, a traumatic event. We disconnected it. And then she literally spit off the names of every teacher she had up until that. And it, it literally blew her mind because the brain represses stuff. It deletes information. It distorts information. Many of us are really good compartmentalizer and we compartmentalize a lot of things. And um, yeah, so it doesn't really matter. Once you start going down the rabbit hole, we'll, we'll, we find it. We've never, we've never not been able to find it. That's interesting. Oh, hmm. Do you, oh, hearing your story, it felt like, uh, and I don't know if this is accurate or not. I have a lot of suicide in my family and mm -hmm. I have, uh, I'm a stand-up comedian. There's a lot of suicide in that uh, community. And then there, the military community, obviously a lot of suicide and, do you find that there a lack of purpose contributes to it? When you were telling your story, it sounded like every time you lost something that you were working towards outside yourself, that it brought those emotions onto you. Well, I think purpose is critical for everybody that served, especially if you, you know, if you were in the military, it doesn't matter whether you deployed or not, you have a purpose. And then we come home and we end up isolating and we're disconnected from purpose. And then you start well, that's when the isolation happens is when the brain starts going into those emotions and, and the, the, the emotions will then start presenting. So absolutely, um, you know, Viktor Frankl, you know, he wrote The Man's Search for Meaning, talks about we help ourselves by helping others. So that's why it's so important um, to get plugged in to do something. You've got to have a purpose because as long as you're contributing to somebody else, their benefit and their well-being, you're helping yourself. Every Hands down, there's no question. Purpose is definitely part of the problem. And I think that's one of the benefits of organizations like the American Legion, which is why we're here, is it does provide uh, not just camaraderie of affiliation with other veterans, but you do kind of uh, come together with, with bigger purposes, with the different programs and things like that. And also with that, I think it's important to highlight uh, our fight as well against uh, veteran suicide with the be the one program right and i can see a lot of what you're doing being really helpful in this area so my question this will probably this will probably be my last one um is about access if if somebody's not in georgia mm -hmm. where you are and i assume the the headquarters of your nonprofit is how do they how do they get connected with the the therapy that you're talking about so get help at 220.org is the email to request assistance. And within 24 hours, you're going to be contacted by the case manager. You'll have an assessment done, and then you'll be assigned a coach. We have coaches all over the United States. We have coaches from Washington state to, you know, Vermont, to Virginia, to Florida, you know, to Georgia, we're, we're all over the place and the work is done remotely. So 99.9% .9 of the work we do is virtual. Because all we got to do is be able to see the person to make sure they're not super triggered into those emotions. We want to get them out of that once it's active. And, you know, with the capacity at 220 is actually pretty significant. Uh, we could probably process between 750 to 1,000 people a month. And because we actually pay the coaches to work with the veterans, as long as the funding is there. And, and you know, we're lucky to have we're lucky to have uh, communications with like American Legion of Florida is a, a sponsor for 220, the Project Vet Relief, which is their nonprofit uh, challenge 22 out of winter garden they they fund 220 and all those funds go to pay the coaches to actually work with um other veterans so 
you know, it's, it's pretty cool. Cause now we're giving purpose to the coaches. They now have also have income coming in and they're healing their brothers and sisters. Right. right, so right. Back, back to that purpose. You got to contribute. You got to be part of something bigger than yourself. Right now, Mike, I guess one of my purposes is uh, locating Ashley Gudermuth. She kind of went away there for a second and she's back. All right. So uh, I, I, I hope that um, you can get into a conversation with some people at the American Legion. It's interesting. I was just talking about the, yesterday I was on a call about training at our California convention, a mm -hmm. state you didn't mention, by the way, I'm not hurt. We, we have but, coaches in California. My bad. I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be okay. Um, but we were talking about the, what kind of innovative uh, training we can do at convention. Maybe we can find one of your coaches and, and have them do a session there. I don't know, but I can talk to you about that later. Sure. All right, Ashley, you want to say bye? Or do you want to? Goodbye. Thank you for so much for being on the podcast. It was great to meet you. Thanks, Ashley. It's a pleasure. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. I could say anything to her and she can make it uh, interesting sounding. If I could probably ask her for a recipe that included rosemary and she would boop, boop, boop. Maybe. I don't know. She's thinking about it now. <laughs> so I also thank you. Thank you for uh, obviously your various levels of service and continued service, especially to those who have served. There, to me, there's there's nothing more honorable than that in in our community. And thank you so much for all of the information. Holly's got it all written down. So uh, I'm hoping you see. I mean, it's unfortunate that that the that the that the supply is out there but i hope that you see a demand for your services and in a little little spike little tango alpha lima spike and then obviously the ashley gutermuth spike so thank you so much we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get to our alphas and we're gonna talk about you when you're not here hopefully we won't trigger you when you see it <laughs> we do you know how to handle it and alpha Absolutely. I'm going to have you wait around for us until after the break. A veteran is a veteran. A veteran is a veteran. A veteran is a veteran. The American Legion embraces all current and former members of the military and endeavors to help them transition into their communities. We are Veterans Strengthening America. We are the American Legion. All right, and we are back. Uh, I want to thank Dan so much for, I mean, such an abundance of information. I'm glad there's things in the the show notes so that we can go refer to some things. Uh, do you have a Do you have a takeaway, Ashley? It's it's super interesting. You know, I did some research on his website. They he talks about how they don't even it, their goal is to not mention the trauma in the therapy, which is so and that's so interesting to me that they find different ways to basically rewire people's brains and just think about the possibilities. If they can deal with suppressed and repressed memories, that's huge. Right. I think that, the, I think the goal is just to let the brain unpack itself and, and, and then they, then they deal with those triggers, which it's, it's awesome. All right. We're moving on to our, what is my favorite part of the show. It's consistent. It's warm. It's cozy. And it's reminiscent of uh, being at the being at the range for range day because we are now entering into the zone we call pew, 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 pew. rapid fire. All right, rapid fire number one. The twenty. This is this is news you can use out there. Post the twenty twenty three Memorial Day speech is available online at legion.org on memorial day the american legion will honor more than one million men and women who have lost their lives defending america since the revolutionary war an american legion memorial day speech for 2023 is available for american legion departments districts and posts to use for memorial day events i have written here the speech is available here but you cannot see that so look into the show notes please like how i describe the picture yeah, uh, the speech is not meant to be recited verbatim. Members are greatly encouraged to amend it to taste an audience. That scares me a little bit. Uh, American Legion posts are encouraged <laughs> to upload recaps and photos of their Memorial Day celebrations and other community activities to guess where? 
legiontown.org. Uh, Legion Town, <laughs> Legion Town is a place for Legionnaires to tell stories of all the good they do every day and to see how other Legionnaires across the country are doing the same. I put this to you out there. If you post this, I'm gonna find it, I'm gonna see it. I'm probably gonna talk about the best, the best couple. So get on legiontown.org with your Memorial Day speeches when that time comes up and we will see you. And I don't think it even has to be, I don't think it has to be at an event. If you are feeling the urge to make your own video, just reciting the speech i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm still gonna applaud it may just be two claps but i am gonna applaud what do you think they're good to move yeah uh do you, do you know what you're doing on memorial day this year i don't remember huh? <laughs> uh we probably will do we typically do something at the post and okay. uh yeah. will you recite you, the speech uh i may yeah okay that's an option it's a tool in your toolkit it'll be the end of my commander year oh my god yeah then yeah maybe i'll do that okay there you go and i'll guess where i'll put it where the recording where will you put it tell me tell me now legiontown.org oh you can finally <laughs> run for mayor once you're not commander anymore. <laughs> oh i've been running for mayor all right, ready to move on to rapid fire number pew pew two. Fort Gordon families say base housing still plagued with mold, sewage, and other problems. This comes from Stars and Stripes. I hope you've never had to deal with this, Ashley. This sounds like the worst. Actually, it's probably for enlisted people. You wouldn't probably know about it. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Erin Greer, her husband, and their children have lived with poor housing conditions on Fort Gordon for more than six years, she said Tuesday, describing moldy walls, flooded bathrooms, sometimes with sewage water, and a partially collapsed ceiling in their residence. Last year, after several failed attempts to convince the Ballflower Beatty officials in charge of the Fort Gordon housing of the problems plaguing their home, Greer moved her family out deciding it was safer to sleep in their cars or outside on their porch than stay inside the house she said during a senate oversight session in washington while the issue of substandard military housing has made uh, national headlines for years and sparked numerous pentagon congressional and independent inquiries the problems at least at fort gordon have not improved greer told senator john Ossoff a Democrat out of Georgia. I want you to know that the problems with Ballflower Beatty have not gone away, Greer said, fighting back tears. The situation has gotten worse. Please, please tell me you've not had to deal with things like this. What the, and then insert your favorite explicitive here. Oh my God. Insane. For, I have dealt with mold. I've had issues. Uh, obviously not to this degree, it, um, is horrific. It's disgusting. The way that all military housing is controlled by only a handful of families, the way that the contracts have been written, the way that people make money, it just, it, and then where it goes. People have mushrooms growing in their house. Mushrooms. L like the mold, I can't handle mold. If I walk into a place and there's mold, I literally would have to do what she did and go and be and sleep in my car. I would have to do that. Uh, the idea that anyone could have a business on a military base and know that people have mold in their houses, that they're sleeping in their cars, that they have sewage issues, that they're probably their water is orange fantic orange because it always is. It's not soda. No, it's something going on with the house. Uh, and you're you in you can sleep at night on your money beds letting people live in these types of environments you make me sick i i don't know i don't know how you haven't been destroyed emotionally i don't know how you you aren't uh just uh, at night just staring at a wall wondering how do i live this life but you need to change go find the god of your choice and apologize because this has to stop. 
I'm sick of it. Why would we, sometimes that's the only place that you can live. These people don't have enough money to buy food. You're going to take all of their BAH. They're not going to be able to get jobs. And they got, they can't even live in the house. Are you kidding me? Like, why would they stay? The, one of the biggest threats to national security, I'm going to say, are the housing companies. And I'll guess what, that I will go home to my house on base and it'll have a sign that says, actually, you can't live here anymore because you're saying that we're bad. But fine. If that's jacked up. This is terrible. Now you have to take the non-biased route and you have to defend the housing companies. I do. <laughs> Isn't this a non-biased podcast? <laughs> <laughs> well, when you told, it's funny because you said they were sleeping on their money beds and then you had them uh, referenced that they go to visit the God of their choice. They're sleeping on the They're, they're sleeping. God of their, yeah, bro, the yeah God money of their is choice. the God of their choice. Yeah, yeah, Makes yeah. me sick. All right. I hope, uh, do we, Holly, do we, do we, as an organization, is this a legislative thing ever? Or do I need to write a resolution? It's, it's handled? All right. So um, if it gets to, I hope if it ever gets to voter voice, I hope that people out there are signed up, ready to take action at legion.org backslash action. So that when these things come up, you can click and let your elected officials know that you're as mad as Ashley Gutermuth was right now. And you can do something about it in seconds if you if you sign up ahead of time. Uh, so please do that. Right now we're going to move on to a little bit better news. We're going to go to pew, 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 three. Uh, you get one year of LinkedIn premium and LinkedIn learning for free. Now this is, we probably talked about this, I believe in um, season one, but it, it's been a long time and we have more listeners now and viewers and they've expanded. So LinkedIn offers eligible members of the US military community, veterans, service members and military spouses. I also saw that they've recently added caregivers to this. You get one year of premium career subscription. With the premium, you get additional features to help accelerate your career development, including advanced job recommendations, competitive insights and job opportunities, and access to more than 17,000 LinkedIn learning courses. Those used to be called uh, lynda.com if you were born in the 1900s, I guess, right? Isn't that what the kids say now? Oh, was that back in the 1900s? Is that back in the olden days? You had one computer and your internet went like this. <laughs> yeah, that one. That one. So have you, you're, you're, you're on LinkedIn. You're kind of a big I'm deal. I'm on right? LinkedIn. I'm a big deal on LinkedIn. I post a lot of um, my comedy on LinkedIn. And the reason why I do that is because I never want to have a real job again. And I want to burn those bridges. Yeah, it's okay. working. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I think that that's, that's great. The one-year premium career subscription, because it also allows you to see who's looked at your profile, which is great um, for people that are nosy. And um, also, what was I going to say? Dang it. Oh, you mentioned caregivers. So I've been spending some time with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, which is what helps people, uh, veteran caregivers, um, which are often military spouses. And it's uh, uh, unbelievable. It's, they have unbelievable stories and the, they need to be taken care of. Uh, so I'm glad that they are a part of it. And I think, you know, one of the things I've heard you talk about is the, uh, the moving around of the families and, and, and yeah. how it's tough to find jobs. And I, and hopefully some of this, because it's also, you can find jobs on here, but you can also, you know, you can develop skills for no money and yeah. get certification here for no money. So um, I think that, I think that that's awesome. And I'd love to see more people do that. What do you think? I'm on board. All you know right. And there's some links in there of, um, for uh, the military spouse subscription and then uh, the veteran subscription. And then I, it was late. I'm not going to lie. Um, I didn't find the one for the caregivers, but I can, I can no, do it's that. Okay. So, you, well, you know, that military quality of life is one of the American Legion's legislative priorities. Ooh. Mm -hmm. You know why? 
because the U.S. military's greatest resources are individual service members and their families. Yeah. You darn tootin'. There you go. I just said darn tootin'. I probably heard Holly say that before. <laughs> she she has she has a lot of she has a lot of quirky little sayings, and I and I adore them all. I do. I can't help it because they're adorable. All right. This is a this is a good show. Yeah. I think we did well. We're starting we're starting birth month of Jeff Daly off really well here in May. Yeah. The twenty first, if you're sending things. Finally nineteen. So <laughs> yes. cute. Again, I'm getting really good at it. Uh let's see. Why don't we uh I don't have a shout out. I don't have a shout out today. Hmm. No. Nope. Okay. All right. No. Nope. I don't have if one. you think that I should have, you need to you need to act better and remind me because I'm getting old. It's my birth month. All right, uh, right. Take us home, please. Hey, Alphas. You know what? Please don't forget to subscribe. Do whatever you have to do. Take your echinacea, um, your ginkgo bilobas. Don't forget to subscribe to the Tango Alpha Lima podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. If you can, and really, I know this is asking a lot, if you can leave us a review um, and give us a big, just five stars. Because if you don't give us five stars, I'm going to find out what your nightmares were as a child. And then I'm going to reenact them uh, w- while you're at work, like in the daytime. It's not going to be that bad. It's just one of my things, like when my, uh, if I win a lot of money, I plan on hiring a man dressed as a panda to follow my dad around, but at a far enough distance that he's always just like, hey, there's a panda like within 50 feet of me at all times so that it freaks them out, but the panda can always get away. I just want you to know that's how my brain works. So five stars. Five stars. <clears throat> we you know who you guest- are. We know who you are. If you only do four stars, we know who you are. And if you do three coming. stars, we know who you were. Oh, we know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want you to know what I would do. <laughs> If you have a guest recommendation, I want to hear it. Go to legion.org forward slash Tango Alpha Lima. Click on the suggest a guest link. Send it to us. I want to hear it. Jeff, I love you. All right. Thank you guys for uh, joining us for this jam-packed, really, uh, really powerful episode. I loved every second of it. I have my my friend and co-host, AG 2.0. We have a new friend in Dan Jarvis. And we have talked about many, many things that affect the the life quality of many many people and i'm glad you're here with us i hope you'll get more involved get more engaged so that we can change the freaking world and right before i get too emotional i'm gonna go ahead and declare season four episode 157 mission complete